from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. It seems like something from a bygone era, the milkman. It makes me happy to know that we're making milk fun. See one Midwest dairy's mission to bring it back. Dangerously high heat. It's miserable. As portions of the West enter another day of triple digit temperatures. Plus a new look at the balance sheet. These anecdotal yields, yield numbers we're hearing are just uh, quite, quite strong. What we'll be watching for in USDA's next big report, right now on Ag Day. Ag Day is brought to you by Pioneer. Ben's bins, please hold. Yeah, Ben's has been busy all day. Seems like no one can keep up with this new Z series. What did you all put in these seeds? Science. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Corn futures struggle to stay on the positive side of things while soybeans sunk for a third straight day. All of this weighing on the minds of traders as the market prepares for the next supply and demand report on Friday. Ag Day's Michelle Rook joins me. Michelle, we're going into this report with a larger than expected corn acreage number and higher grain stocks. Yeah, that's right. USDA has to incorporate both the higher acreage and quarterly stocks into the corn balance sheet in the July WASD. And so that will be the focus. And the market is anticipating a somewhat bearish report as a result. Meanwhile, for both soybeans and wheat, only minor adjustments. Market analysts say it's too early for USDA to make yield changes in this report. However, the additional 1.4 million acres of corn in the June acreage report get worked in, so it's expected to raise corn production by 190 million bushels. And it won't be offset by acres lost to prevent plant flooding or even hail until later in the season. As we move into August, uh, that's when we get our first estimate. So they, USDA starts to estimate the crop based on farmer surveys, satellite imagery, and other factors. And, and uh, so uh, that's when some of that could come into play. The other factor is in August uh, is the acreage stuff. So FSA acreage data will start to be incorporated. And, and so we'll start to see some of those acres that have been lost to uh, the flooding, excessive moisture, uh, hail, those types of things. However, USDA also has to incorporate bigger quarterly stocks for corn, so ending stocks are estimated to increase by 25 million bushels on old crop and 187 million on new crop, approaching 2.3 billion bushels. You are going to see uh, old crop ending stocks uh, rise a little bit, although there's a possibility that they could be offset by, by some higher uh, exports and by higher ethanol grind, but the, the feed residual usage number is going to have to move based on that uh, 120 some million bushels of uh, uh, feed uh, that you know, or disappearance that did not occur. Um, and that's that's uh, fuel for adding to beginning stocks for next year. And Quarterly stocks were also higher for wheat, but with slightly better demand, the trade guess for carryover shows a 27 million bushel increase. And better than expected yields will offset the 260,000 less acres, so production is called higher. Our numbers imply 45 million bushel increases over last month's production estimate for total wheat. Uh, and I think that's very well known. These anecdotal yield, yield numbers we're hearing are just uh, quite, quite strong. For soybeans, bigger quarterly stocks and slow export demand put old crop carryover projections up 27 million bushels, but new crop stocks could be down 7 million due to a 26 million bushel drop in production on 400,000 less acres. I'm Michelle Work reporting for Ag Day. All right, thanks, Michelle. Now, in the West, many farmers are working to try and cut the impacts of a dangerous heat wave with prolonged triple digit temperatures in some key ag regions, including California. Meanwhile, power outages continue in Texas following Hurricane Barrel, which hit the state as a Category 1 storm. Laura Aguirre has the latest on the heat and the remnants of Barrel, which are hitting the Midwest and Northeast. It's going to be days. It's going to be days. A harsh reality facing well over a million people in Texas, still without power after a devastating hit from what was Hurricane Barrel Monday. Searing in temperatures reaching the triple digits in several places. Local energy officials are feeling the heat when pressed for a timeline on restoring power. Look, we live here, we work here, we have employees that don't have power as well. It's miserable. We're motivated to get people back on as quickly as possible. 
The life-threatening heat wave is also scorching most of the western U.S. for another day Wednesday. In Washington state, broiling concrete roadways are expanding. When it expands, it kind of starts to put pressure on each other, so you could create more friction, and then it, one tends to pop. We haven't got a lot of suspension. For farmers hauling goods by tractor, buckling roads are more than just bumpy. You kind of get a lot of movement, and there's a lot of product flying around and things getting broken. The U.S. Coast Guard flew into action over the Rogue River Trail in southern Oregon Tuesday after a legally blind hiker was overcome by heat exhaustion. Both he and his dog were rescued safely. From heat to the threat of flooding and possible tornadoes in the Midwest and Northeast as remnants of storm barrel wash across several states from Missouri to Maine into Thursday morning. Barrel washed over the Ohio Valley overnight, leaving a number of home and business owners there, much like parts of the Gulf Coast, facing a long recovery. I'm Laura Aguirre, reporting for Ag Day. When will the West bust out of this heat wave? We get the latest from meteorologist Matt Engelbrecht. Yeah, we're looking at that heat continuing to stick around. The difference uh, is what's going on into the Midwest and the Northeast. If you remember that tropical system, who can forget a barrel that came through? Lots of rain, uh, but it was only for two thirds of the United States. That one third was back over here to the Northwest and of course the West Coast where ridge of high pressure continues to dominate and it is going to continue to be the case. A removed uh, that tropical system now removed from the equation. We get back into just kind of the meat of a summertime pattern. I mean, the jet stream isn't going to be moving that far up north or south. Uh, rather, it's going to be pretty stagnant, meaning the hot air that is in place with the ridge high pressure in the southeast uh, and to the northwest will continue to heat up day after day. So through the 15th and the 19th, you're looking at nearly 90% of the United States with that temperature outlook above average. And wow, check out this beautiful harvest sunset. Hannah capturing this shot near Colorado and they're moving right along with harvest. USDA says 51% of the wheat has been cut in the state. That's well ahead of the five year average of 18%. I'll have more in your forecast coming up. California, known for its strict fuel regulations and high prices. Well, a new study says drivers could save some money and utilize more renewable fuel if stations were allowed to sell E15. That study is sponsored by the Renewable Fuels Association, and it comes from UC Berkeley and the U.S. Naval Academy. Now, it found Golden State drivers could save about 20 cents per gallon if gas stations sold E15. Currently, California is the only state where the fuel isn't approved, but state regulators are considering approving it after extensive vehicle testing. Now, the study says consumers could save up to $2.7 billion annually, or roughly $200 per household. The EPA says E15 is legally approved for use in all cars, pickups, SUVs, and vans manufactured in the last 24 years. Now, a sad update to bring you. A woman who received a pig kidney transplant earlier this year passed away on Sunday. Lisa Paisano underwent surgery for the transplant at NYU Lagoon Health in April, but the organ was removed in late May after it failed due to limited blood flow. The 54-year-old was the second known living person to receive a gene-edited pig kidney, a spokesperson for the hospital, applauding Paisano's bravery, saying she gave hope to thousands of people living with heart failure and end-stage kidney disease who could benefit from alternative organs. Now, Paisano was the first person to receive a mechanical heart pump along with a gene-edited pig kidney. Doctors learning from these experimental surgeries, hoping to begin clinical trials of pig organs next year. The route continues in soybeans and wheat. We'll talk markets as they continue to make multi-year lows coming up next. And later, a return to a time-honored service as this Indiana dairy rekindles its milkman roots in the country. Tyson Foods says it's selling its poultry complex in Vienna, Georgia to House of Rayford Farms. The move seen as part of Tyson's ongoing efforts to streamline operations and improve profitability in its meat and poultry business. House of Rayford Farms says poultry processing will continue at the facility utilizing the current workforce. It is one of the 10 largest chicken producers in the U.S. The company operates poultry grow out operations in processing facilities in four southeastern states. The deal still needs approval 
from U.S. regulators. China makes its first buy of new crop U.S. soybeans, 4.85 million bushels, but soybeans continue to pull back midweek. Agnes Michelle Rook is here to discuss it with Tommy Grishoffi. Marcus now. Well, another mostly lower day in the grains on Wednesday, with the exception of old crop corn. Tommy Grisafi with Advanced Trading is joining us. And Tommy, it's been uh, pretty ugly in both the corn and soybean market. We're at three-year lows. You know, do you feel like we're justified to be at these price levels? I mean, especially with what we see with the weather and whatnot. That's a great question. I, I notice when markets make extreme lows or extreme highs, they don't always stay there that long, but an incredible amount of volume can trade on this low. So if there's old crop bushels that need to hit the market, they'll they'll hit it at these low levels. Um, when markets go up, sometimes you see huge, huge volume trade on the highs and lows. And uh, do we stay there for a long time? Well, the way I look at that, Michelle, is I look at uh, December 24 corn futures, 25, 26, 27, and uh, December 25 futures have been flirting with 450, probably close a little, uh, right around that level again today. But, you know, we have the 405, 410 level in DS 24. So it looks like even uh, a big rally here in years to come is a 50 cent rally until things change, right? A huge problem in the world, big demand, things change, funds are really short, but that doesn't mean they're wrong. The funds are short and right now they have it correct. Yeah, they do, but they usually only push so short and then maybe change or pivot. What could get them to do that at this point? Is there anything? The uh, United States government has allowed funds to have larger position limits, which allows them to sell more. There used to be, hey, you can only sell this much. That that levels went up tremendously, and they're getting a chance to flex their muscles. As I look over to my right, the stock market, the Dow Jones is approaching 40000 And all these prior examples of what the funds could or couldn't do there wasn't as much money in the world. There wasn't as much debt. There wasn't as many dollars looking for a home. So I do think the funds can continue to sell it until they decide they want to be a buyer. And that would be very interesting, Michelle. You think this is an old crop situation as well, that farmers are actually selling and pitching in the towel too? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Funds are adding to the short and farmers are definitely pitching the towel on basis contracts, starting to sweep the bins. I don't think they're telling anyone about it. I don't think they're going to the coffee shop and bragging about it, but yes, old crop grain is hitting the marketplace. Okay, thanks so much for joining us. Tommy Gersapi with Advanced Trading. We'll have more egg date coming up. Watch Markets Now with Michelle Rook on the Farm Journal YouTube channel, keeping you updated throughout the day on the markets at the open midday and close. Find out what moved the markets today and what to expect the market to do next. Interested in spending a day with a trader? Call Tommy Grisafi at 800-664-4383. Going back to that precipitation forecast, uh, as we saw earlier, there's really not much in the way of large systems like a hurricane or tropical storm or tropical depression uh, coming through the next uh, couple of days or the next week. So where we get the rain, uh, we're really going to kind of have to hold on to it. Now the next the bigger system is out here towards the east coast where we need the rain. About one to three inches of rainfall will be possible up and down the east coast as a ridge of high pressure builds into next week. But this is the seven day precipitation forecast and you see a bubble here and you see a bubble there. Now there's your high pressure the systems setting up setting up across the United States. In between the two, we may get a shallow trough trying to dig into the Midwest and uh, as well as Canada bringing in some rain. But overall, it is going to be a relatively quiet and hot pattern going forward. And this is something that we've been talking about the last couple of days. So the jet stream uh, looking something like this. This is on Thursday. You got a shallow trough uh, digging across the United States and there's that stagnant jet stream pattern setting up. And again, that's starting this weekend. I don't expect this to really shift all that much into next week. Part of the problem we're running into in regards to uh, a lack of rainfall or even uh, a lack of cool air is over here towards the Atlantic. A dominant ridge of high pressure is going to be off the coast. Now that is going to swing in some moisture on the east coast uh, initially, uh, but with that feature staying out in the Atlantic, we're going to get that bottling effect once again back here to the west. And it's a kind of bottling effect uh, where the ridge in the Atlantic is going to support ridging all across the United States. So again, there's that jet stream coming up on Saturday. Most of next week, not seeing much in the way of significant systems working through.
Baker, Louisiana, got some evening thunderstorms, 92 degrees with that high, low about 74. Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, mostly sunny, high around 101, low of about 63. And then Vermont got rain from that tropical system, high of 82. In our crime file, animals on the loose. First, a sheep on the lamb in Minnesota. Police pulling out all the stops, but the animal just wouldn't stop running. This all happened in the city of Zumbrata this week. Two officers managing to corner the sheep in a fenced in yard, but it just charged through the fence. Finally, they enlisted the help of some local cowboys from Central Livestock in Zumbrata to wrangle the sheep and they didn't mess around tackling that woolly rascal and getting the situation under control. The chief saying to them, you, that's E-W-E, are awesome. Animals running afoul doesn't end there. Check out these police chasing chickens that flew the coop in Kettering, Ohio. The chase lasting so long that one officer took a Skittles break. Well, that seemed to do the trick. The officers were soon able to corral them. Now, those pesky horseflies are hard to catch. We'll tell you why the experts say livestock owners need to be on the lookout this month. Next. And later, a sixth generation dairy farm has a new take on an old service. We're off to Fort Wayne, Indiana in the country. Populations of a particularly nasty and biting pest are expected to grow in the coming weeks. Experts expecting higher than normal horsefly populations in some areas this summer. Now, one entomologist at Texas A&M says all the wet weather we've seen recently, followed by the widespread rainfall from Tropical Storm Barrel, could mean an increase in populations, especially there in Texas. And that could be a big problem for Texas livestock owners because that persistent biting fly is difficult to control. Now, the flies typically stay in shaded areas, such as along tree lines, but they can be in several other locations as well, making them hard to treat. Experts say the best defense for livestock is to move them from an infested area into a barn or to cover them with those lightweight summer sheets designed to stop biting flies and mosquitoes. They say traps specifically designed for horse flies can also reduce the population. Scientists are touting more lab grown meat, this time in South Korea. Researchers there say they can create lab grown meat, which is nothing new, but this group of researchers claims it actually tastes like meat, even generating flavors that give it a charred taste. The meatless meat is developed by cultivating animal cells in a lab where they can then multiply. However, this cell culture meat is not yet edible. Instead, researchers using an electronic nose to test out the aromas of the cultured meat, and they say it could offer up the same nutrition without having a carbon footprint. However, some studies have suggested that potential environmental impact of lab-grown meat is overstated. Home deliveries from companies like Amazon are pretty common these days. And now this Indiana farm wants to bring milk deliveries back to their neighbors. Their plan to relaunch the milkman next. You can soon see a milkman traveling down the roads in Indiana as Allie Butts of Ag Day affiliate WPTA tells us a sixth generation family farm is looking to bring back that old tradition in the Fort Wayne area. The Keener family farm is known for their delicious milk served in glass bottles. It makes me happy to know that we're making milk fun and good and nutritious for any way to drink. You know? Andrew Keener, manager at the Milk House, says there are plans to take their old-fashioned approach one step further. Well, that's in the next stage of plans here is to bring back the milkman where we have glass bottles and do home delivery and have little little milkman <laughs> trucks that we drive around and you put an order in and then uh, we bring glass bottles right to the right to the porch, you know. And with the popularity of their products, they will go beyond delivering just milk. We really think that would be an awesome idea to have our milk delivered and have cheese curds and butter delivered right to your door. He hopes to keep the classic feel while still adding a modern twist. It's awesome that we have cool flavors now that they didn't have back in the old days. You know, our cotton candy milk or orange cream, even our Moo Moo Mint milk, you know, it's, that's, that can all be delivered right to your doorsteps. Keener says they hope this is another way for them to connect with the community. With us being the Keener Milk House, you know, we want to make our milk from our house to your house. And that's ultimately what we want to do with that delivery route. They plan for all orders to be done online and have the milkmen back on the road 
within the next three months. And our thanks to Allie and WPTA for sharing that story with us. And that's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in from all of us here at Ag Day. I'm Clinton Grimace. Have a great day. I'm Farmer.